Ken Island, along with Barbara Sutherland. Um, the two of us, along with our engineering counterparts, Josh Tashong and Kate Eaton, would like to welcome everybody here tonight to our innovation night. So, we would really like to thank, obviously, all of you in attendance, because without the support of the fellow teachers, our administration, the Board of Ed members, parents, classmates, friends, our mentors to our student groups, none of these projects would have been possible. So we want to thank all of you for all of your ongoing support throughout the semester. It definitely hasn't been an easy semester for a lot. A lot of tears, frustration, changes of plans, reinventing an initial innovation, um, and rethinking what we thought was first possible. So we do have to thank everybody for their ongoing support. So as we have heard all throughout this year, you know, this is an exciting time to finally be back in front of people presenting, being here with a live audience versus virtual or in a modified manner. So we are really thankful that we can be here all together, allowing our students to present their innovations to you. Whoops. So, our biomedical students have conducted a lot of theoretical projects along with an experimental project. Uh, we have one experimental and the rest are all theoretical. And they do range uh, from development to nanotechnology, stem cells, diagnostic testing, therapy, preventive technologies, holistic medicine to help health issues. As, as long as, or as well as, excuse me, a lot of other different types of innovations that have been included. You will learn and you will hear from our students a small abstract to introduce their project, and we invite you to join them at their posters after the presentations to ask them questions and learn more in depth about what their projects are about. So again, we thank you all for being here. I'm sure you're gonna be very impressed with everything our students have been able to innovate this year, this semester. Their brains are amazing, and we know they are gonna do some amazing things in the future. So we really are very excited to welcome everybody here tonight, and we hope you enjoy your evening. Mr. Deshaun. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I could just echo a little bit of what Ms. Ritz said. Uh, just thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Uh, to the parents of my engineering students. Thank you for putting up with them while on virtual learning. Um, this has been a great year to get back. I know for the engineering kids, uh, everybody was really just excited to be back to doing hands-on projects again in the classroom. Um, their projects are a little bit different. You'll see a little bit of a contrast from some of the biomed projects as they're actually required to come up with an original invention or innovation uh, and create a working, functioning prototype. And I think we have uh, seven really successful projects for you guys to learn a little bit about. Um, and, you know, look at these as kind of more, who, who's going to be the next one on Shark Tank? Uh, that's what we like to talk about in the engineering class. So, on behalf of Ms. Pete and I, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we look forward to getting everybody started. My name is Maggie Ratcliffe, and this is Joshua. This is Joshua Zorofinsky. Our innovation is the nanoparticle gel for the treatment of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a heart condition that kills over 300,000 people per year in the United States alone. Um, atherosclerosis occurs when there is too much cholesterol in the bloodstream, leading to the creation of plaques along arterial walls. This plaque um, is shown in the image to the right the, on the heart. Um, in the heart to the left is a normal heart, and you can see that there are no constrictions. On the heart to the right, the atherosclerosis heart the cells are blocked behind the cholesterol, which can lead to blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes. All of this can be deadly. 
Currently, there are three treatments to treat atherosclerosis. The first, an, an angioplasty, seen in the top right, is a balloon guided by a catheter in, that inflates inside the blood vessel to push the plaque to the side of the blood vessel. The second, seen in the top left, is a stent implant, which is very similar to a angioplasty, but instead leaves a mesh inside the blood vessel that held, holds the that holds the plaque to the uh, side of the walls. The last is a bypass surgery, which takes a blood vessel from the from a different part of the body and surgically makes a new pathway for the blood around the blockage. And while all three of these are effective treatments, we found that none of these actually remove the plaque from the blood vessel and instead move around it or move it aside. In order to address this, we have designed a nanoparticle gel. The gel is, made, is comprised of the protein albumin that holds the a drug a uh, uh, drug containing nanoparticle that is delivered to this uh, site applied to a uh, angioplasty by either the surgeon or by the manufacturer this provides a immediate benefit from the stent or angioplasty as well as a long-term lasting effect from the nanoparticle delivering the gel or delivering the drug directly to the site. If you are interested in hearing more about our project, please come visit us at our poster. Good evening. Uh, I am Victor Villardo. And my name is Javier Alvarenga. The light switch. One of the first electrical innovations, yet we still use them today. Now, I'm not a gambler, but I'm willing to bet that the majority of you have come into contact with one today. Whether it was in your bathroom, your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, you name it. Light switches are all around us, and they have become so ingrained into our daily lives that we put almost zero thought into flipping them. So now, you're probably wondering, what's the problem here? Well, light switches are everywhere, but you know what else is everywhere? Bacteria. Bacteria is so common, it will always be a part of our everyday lives, whether we like it or not. The average light switch is home to 112 bacterial colonies per square centimeter, which means that light switches, on average, can have about 400 bacteria colonies living right on the surface for you to touch all the time. The CDC warns that the most effective way to stop the spread of germs through contact is simply by practicing good hand hygiene, which means washing your hands for at least 20 seconds and frequently. Well, what about simple cleaning products? Well, to effectively clean a light switch, you not only have to wipe down the light switch thoroughly, you have to remove the cover and clean that as well. That sounds like a lot of work, especially because the CDC recommends you do this two times a week and if you miss even a little bit of bacteria, bacteria can double every 4 to 20 minutes. So the switch that you just cleaned could be hazardous again within mere hours. We spent weeks looking at current motion activated lights and found that their biggest setback is that if you're, move, if you're not moving too much in a room, the light tends to turn off on you, so you have to wave your hands like a maniac to turn it back on. Um, these switches were meant for commercial use, but what about switches that you can be used in your home? And to have these installed would cost a lot of money and time. So, what's our solution? We bring to you our motion-activated light switch, designed to be able to be activated without even touching your filthy light switch, and unlike current motion Activated light switches are easy to use and quick to install. How this works is we have an Arduino Nano, an HCSR04 ultrasonic sensor, two SG90 servo motors, and four AAA batteries. Obviously, the batteries are for the power. The ultrasonic sensor, how it works is it detects, it sends out sound signals and it detects the movement by having the signals bounce back and records the um, records the readings. 
And then and the Arduino Nano is a CPU that processes the readings of the ultrasonic sensor and tells the servos to switch the uh, switch on or off. So these components are the organs of the operation. And we all know that organs are nothing without a body. In this case, the body is the housing, the plastic case that contains all of our electronics. The housing protects all the delicate electronics while keeping the user safe with no wire left exposed. When you bring all of these pieces together, you are given a light switch that provides the convenience and complexity of touchless technology that stops the spread of harmful bacteria while still having the simplicity and elegance of the traditional light switch that has been an icon in the American household for over a century. All with the wave of a hand rather than the flip of a switch. Good evening, everyone. My name is Taylor Walski. This is my partner, Megan Camp. And our, we, during the past few months, we came up with an innovation called Embrace, which increases the effectiveness of knee braces. The problem that we found was that most athletes and people in general do not, they just like wearing knee braces, often not to, not to wear them when they're playing games or sports or anything like that. And obviously, for regular people following like a surgery or an uh, injury where they're prescribed a knee brace, they, if they don't wear the knee brace, then that can impact their recovery or they can re-injure themselves in general. Uh, one of the problems that we found with the knee braces right now is that the materials increase humidity, and which obviously causes sweat under the knee braces. And a problem that happens when you sweat under the knee braces and everything is that it slides out of position often. And when you're when you're playing a sport or anything, and you're in the middle of a play, you're obviously not going to want to be want to be uh, adjusting the knee brace back into the position constantly. Or if you're just working in general at working in, at your job, you're not going to be one of adjusting it constantly either. Uh, about three and a half million sports injuries occur every single year. And about 60% of these uh, injuries are to the knee itself. And this number, the problem with that is that this number will not go down because athletes just choose not to wear that, wear knee braces or any type of protection material, which can prevent the injuries. Uh, my partner, Megan Cam, is going to be presenting a solution to this problem. When an athlete is injured, it is very important that they allow their knee to properly and protected. If they do not protect their knee properly, it is very possible that their injury will get worse. It is also very important that they allow their knee brace to fit properly. If their knee brace does not fit properly and shifts and slides out of place, it is very possible for their knee to get injured as well. Our innovation embrace will help one of the many problems that come with knee braces. Embrace is an ABS plastic mold that goes at the top and bottom of your knee brace. ABS plastic is a type of removable plastic that has been used multiple times. Some of the benefits that come with our innovation is that if, it, if the user goes, gains or loses weight, it, they can take it off their brace and remold it. Another few benefits that come with it is that it stops the brace from shifting. It's any type of brace, withstands any type of weather, and anybody can use it. Use an embrace will help decrease the amount of any injuries that happen for you. If you want to learn more about our innovation, please come visit us at our poster. Hello, um, my name is Emilio. This is Jacob, and this is Nate. Our project is called the GMC Baseball Return. Our problem, our problem is that uh, oftentimes amateur and high school baseball players find themselves without a uh, partner to pro practice with, and that results in them not practicing. Um, in a reserve, in our survey that we took that included people from our local high school team and other teams from around the country. Uh, we found that only 25% of them uh, responded that they do not frequently practice on their own. 
a lot of the skills that they responded that would that they would practice would be defensive skills, uh, such as fielding grounders, fielding fly balls, just fielding pitches and in general as well as pitching. Um, so to as a solution to that, some prior solutions include um, in the top left there is a, a, it's like a traditional bounce back where you would throw the ball at this net with uh, springs attached around it and it would just bounce it back at you. And the problem with that is that it's, uh, it bounces back at a low speed and it doesn't go that far. Um, the bottom left one is it's a pitching machine, or it's a, it's a strike zone where you could throw the ball into it and it would shoot the ball back at you. But it's very large and expensive and it requires like a separate computer and everything that runs, so it's impractical to use for people practicing on their own. And that's kind of how the, uh, that's kind of the same with the one on the bottom right. It has the same problem where it's too big and too expensive to be used by an individual, which is our, uh, our target market. And in the top right, is, it's a, called a bullwhip, and it's like a bag you put around your hand and you put a baseball inside of it, and you do the motion of pitching. And it's supposed to like, it's supposed to feel like you're throwing the ball, and it's supposed to help you practice muscle memory for pitching. Our solution is a box that we throw the ball into. It hits a pad in the back, which drops the ball into a gutter, which feeds the ball to the machine, which will return the ball back to the pitcher. This solves the problems because you can um, work on the defensive skills you can work on on your own with that, and it will return the ball accurately, unlike the bounce back, which you can't practice at larger distances, and um, it's not always accurate. And it's, it's still large, but it's um, small enough to be able to move around when you want it to be moved, and you can stake it in place. And it's just a prototype. There, there's still a few problems with it. Um, you have to throw it really accurately for it to work, but the concept works and it's simple enough that it can be easily replicated and you don't have to do a lot to be able to make it work. And if you want to see a video of it working, you can come to our stand in the cafeteria. Good evening. My name is Faith Rector, Faith Rector and this is my partner, Garrett Grebel. Over the past few months, we have been working on an innovation to treat Alzheimer's using neural stem cell nanoparticles. Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerate disorder that progressively worsens over time. There are currently more than 5.8 million people over the age of 65 with this disease, and it is the seventh leading cause of death. As one of these leading causes of death, it is the only one that cannot be prevented, cannot be slowed, or cannot be cured. During the progression of Alzheimer's, neurons are injured and die throughout the brain. This causes a breakdown of critical connections and causes regions of the brain to shrink as you can see in the figure above on the left. Additionally, amyloid plaques gradually build up between neurons and these abnormal chemical changes cause tau proteins to detach and latch onto other tau molecules, forming threads that tangle. Both of these result in a decrease of communication throughout the brain. Currently, there is no cure for Alzheimer's, which is an ongoing problem. Current treatments on the market only slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease during the early to middle stages. Our innovation is a theranostic nanoparticle that is injected with neural stem cells to prevent further damages of the neurons within the brain. 
the theranosic nanoparticle will be injected into the spinal fluid through a lumbar puncture and travel across the blood-brain barrier directly into the brain. The nanoparticle is a highly sensitive molecular detection and drug targeting, which will allow for uh, destroying of the tau tangles and amyloid uh, plaques. With other components in our nanoparticle, there will be therapeutic effects and character or diagnostic characteristics, which will improve the cognitive and behavioral functions uh, that the Alzheimer patients have lost. Meaningful conversations that were lost during Alzheimer's disease will be gained back with our nanoparticle and allow for those uh, conversations to come back with those family members. This nanoparticle will be most effective during the early stages, but also effective during the middle and late stages of Alzheimer's disease. If you have any questions, please come visit us at our poster. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Seth Christopher, and the project that uh, I worked on is called Focus Up. Uh, my project is based around a phenomenon known as dissociation, or more commonly, you know, probably you guys as zoning out, uh, which is described by professionals as a feeling of disconnection from oneself. Uh, and this can be an issue because it can uh, decrease the effectiveness and can pretty much prevent anybody from doing something in general. And uh, because my project is so complex and involves a lot of uh, science involving the brain, uh, I had to stay entirely theoretical, which means I spent a majority of my time doing research and finding statistics. Uh, and on the screen right now, you can see the bottom right of the screen, there's a graph. Uh, Dots on the graph uh, represent lapses or moments where subjects answer incorrectly. And you can pretty much see that they align almost perfectly with the blue sections of the line, which were moments where researchers identified that the subject was in the zone or zoning out. Uh, my solution to this project, to this problem, uh, is basically to design something that will stimulate you or will gain your attention when it notices that you are, in fact, zoning out or dissociating. Uh, the main idea is that you have a rig to wear on your head in the top right that has electrodes in it uh, that connects to an Arduino uh, circuit that you can see on the bottom left of the screen. Uh, and that will basically run a uh, program over and over again saying, is this person zoning out? And if you are, it will uh, set off a stimuli in the pair of glasses that you see also on the right, uh, starting with a LED. And then if that does not gain your attention, then it will set off a speaker and play the noise. And if that also does not gain your attention, it will set off a vibration motor that will start vibrating pretty much right next to the back of your almost sure to get your attention. Uh, the majority of my time was spent on the code seen on the bottom right. Uh, oh, that, that took me a very long time. Uh, Good evening, everybody. My name is Brooke Peters. I'm Michaela Mogul. And I'm Sarah Pajak. And tonight we will be discussing holistic mental health interventions in high school environments. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a rapid decrease in students' mental health. Students are experiencing the neglect in their mental health issues and noticing symptoms such as depression, anxiety, fear, confusion, and anger. As seen above, about 65% of students have had a mental health disorder and about 74% of students have had an increase in emotional problems. In early 2021, there's been an increase in suicide attempts, 4% for males and 50% for females. And suicide has become the second leading cause of death in students ages 15 through 19 years old. This problem has become more prevalent due to the pandemic and has created the need for an innovation. 
parents have noticed, especially due to the pandemic, that their children have experienced an increase in their mental health conditions. This can include anxiety, depression, self-isolation, lethargy, irrational fear, and because of the inability to see each other during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an 8% increase post-pandemic of self-withdrawal amongst teens. This has caused their grades and social standings in schools to go down, making medicines and cognitive therapies more necessary for them. But most teens don't want or need this because teens are known for being highly independent. So our new innovation will grant the teens this wish of their independence while still teaching them beneficial coping techniques for their mental health. All right, so for our innovation for this crisis, um, we have developed a 45 minute mental health period known as the MHP. MHP, which will be a hybrid class all year round for students um, all at high school, ninth and 12th grade. It will be in conjunction year long with another class and different mental health periods will focus on uh, exercise therapy or management, coping skills, um, designated time for students even just to catch up on work or even designated time for students to visit their guidance counselor um, for discussing other mental health needs with a trusted adult. Um, specifically, certain classes will focus on uh, endorphins, for example. The exercise therapy class will focus on endorphin release and learn how certain exercises can actually benefit their mental health whereas other students can learn management skills on how to cope with their mental health uh, issues mentally and naturally rather than with a natural medications. Uh, if you would like to learn more information, come visit us in the cafeteria at our poster. Thank you. Good evening. We're here tonight to present to you the reinvention of water bottle hygiene. Clean cap. I'm Danielle Kosowski. I'm Rachel Rickabaugh. I'm Will Renson. In the past, plastic water bottles have been heavily relied on, but have also pointed to several environmental concerns due to the EPA's research. Uh, this has pointed to a cultural switch to environmentally friendly metal reusable bottles that have also had unintended health concerns due to uh, bacterial buildup and improper cleaning habits. The big question is, what happens when 53% of people do not regularly clean their water bottle? Simply put, they become dirtier than your dog's water bottle. This is a growing issue in today's society, and my group members and I have come up with a solution to utilize UPC technology on a large scale to help decrease bacterial growth and pathogenic spread. To test this on a smaller scale, we collected 36 teacher and student water bottles to swab before and after being exposed to UVC LED light for 120 seconds. After they were swabbed, they were then placed on triptych soy auger and placed in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. A statistical analysis was then run and the pair T test showed a 99.6% decrease um, in bacteria growth. Nine of the samples were then taken and gram stand to to show a variety of microorganisms, including E. coli, fungi, staph, and salmonella. These promising results allowed us to move forward with our innovation. Our clean cap design will implement this large-scale UVC technology right in the lids of everyday water bottles. A UV light emits a 265 nanometer wavelength, which creates thymine dimers right in the DNA of the bacteria, which will lead to cell death and bacterial reduction. Our caps will work on a dual lid rotation, the first lid housing the LED and sealing the water bottle for any leaks, while the outer lid will continue to rotate and close a torque switch design that allows the UV light to turn on for 120 seconds for bacteria mitigation and overall reduction of pathogenic illness spread. This allows for cleaning to occur every time a user closes their bottle and this new wave of technology will, be, will bring effective cleaning to everyone's busy lives and will become accessible for all. So if you would like to take back your clean drinking water and join the Clean Cap family, please come see us at our poster in the cafeteria. 
Good evening. My, my name is Faith Hartlove, and this is my partner, Anna Jensen. And today we're presenting our project on treating retinitis pigmentosa using nanotechnology. Retinitis pigmentosa is a degenerative and genetic eye disease that impacts roughly 1 million people worldwide. The main symptoms of this disease include color vision loss, night blindness, and photophobia, which is the sensitivity to light. There are 58 known mutations in the genes that can cause this disorder, but in this project, we focused on one, the RP1 gene mutation. There are available technologies to assist people with this disease, such as service dogs and amber filter glasses to prevent photophobia, as previously mentioned. While all of these are very good at increasing independence and quality of life, none of them treat or cure the disease. As Faith mentioned, the, the RP1 gene mutation is the focus of our innovation. The RP1 gene mutation is defined by its proteins, which are produced too short. This causes the cell the inability to the cell the inability to organize its discs. Our innovation is an injection intravitreally into the eye of a nanotechnology, which has a nucleus that contains the healthy versions of these RP1 proteins um, that are. In, that are then provided to these cells. If you would like to learn more about our poster, please come meet us in the cafeteria. Hi, my name is Noah Wigglesworth, this is Matt Soleil and Evan Tambiero, and our project is the AQ Informer. As the world reopens again after the COVID-19 pandemic, people have begun to move back into indoor spaces like offices and People are more conscious now than ever for their respiratory health, and yet no portable device currently exists to easily monitor indoor air quality for common indicators such as CO2 concentration and volatile organics. Climate change is currently leading the way in, in increasing the pollutants in the air. Our research has shown that the general working population is better at doing work when they don't feel that they're at risk of illness. Throughout our research, we have researched the following diseases. We've researched Legionnaire's disease and sick building syndrome, which can both result from the symptoms caused by poor indoor air quality. Being in these, being in these indoor air these environments with poor indoor air quality can lead to symptoms. 9% of those who we surveyed in our 70 person survey stated that they feel completely uninformed or only mildly informed about indoor air quality. 48% of cases of sick building syndrome, as Evan described earlier, can be directly linked to poor indoor air quality as a result of inadequate ventilation. And people spend 90% of their time in indoor environments. Our solution to this problem is a portable air quality monitor that measures the carbon dioxide and VOCs of the user's environment. The, the device utilizes an Arduino connected to a carbon dioxide sensor, which displays readings on an LCD display. The device has built-in parameters to determine if the readings are safe or unsafe. If the readings are determined to be unsafe, the device will create an audible buzz to alert the user. The device has two buttons, one to mute and unmute the device, and another to switch screens to access more information. Thank you for your attention. Please come visit our complete prototype following the presentations. Hi, my name is Wyatt Mitt My partner is Jordan Andrada and Ellie Lawrence. And our innovation is on treating depression during a vitamin B enriched diet. Depression is a mental health disorder that is categorized as a persistently down or sad mood. Depression is one of the most common mental health disorders affecting approximately 4% of the population worldwide and 8% of Americans. Depression is caused by the depletion of serotonin levels within the body. 
Those affected by depression may experience, may experience a decrease in quality of life, an increase in risk of suicide, and impairments of physical and social aspects of life, such as sudden loss in interests or hobbies, and overwhelming sadness. The current available treatment options for those experiencing depression are psychotherapy, which includes meeting with a mental health specialist, and pharmacotherapy, which includes the use of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs. These treatments are very expensive and not for everyone. SSRIs alter the chemical makeup of the brain, often producing many negative side effects, feelings of emotional numbness, and many patients have become dependent on them. There are currently no natural approaches for treating depression. In our research, we found that vitamin B plays a huge role in the body of converting amino acids into neurotransmitters such as serotonin. We also found that vitamin B deficiency is very common among patients experiencing depression, possibly contributing to their experience. Our innovation is an all-natural approach to treat depression. It is a meal plan that consists of foods that are naturally high in vitamin B. As previously mentioned in our presentation, vitamin B plays a key role in the production of serotonin, and serotonin is essential for the stability of your mood and mental health. In this meal plan, the meals will be pre-packaged for easy preparation, and the foods within the meal will contain a variety of foods from different food groups, in order to ensure that the patient is receiving a balanced diet. In addition to this, the, me the meals will contain balanced amounts of vitamin B to ensure the patient is also receiving their daily intake of vitamin B each day. If you guys would like to learn more about our innovation, please come join us in the cafeteria at our poster. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to introduce my teammates, Myself, I'm Colin McConnell, this is Bobby Wanch, and that's Tyler Reynolds. Uh, our innovation is the self-watering Christmas tree. Now, I, like most people, think that Christmas time is my favorite time of the year, you know? Uh, it's wonderful, I just love it as much as anyone else does. But the one thing I hate personally is having to water my tree every day. It's just a hassle. I'm six foot one, I can't really, you know, lean under my tree and get all up under there, you know? So, our innovation is to make that easy. It's an innovation for the common man, and when we were researching how we can make this a more streamlined experience, our three biggest problems that we came up with were, you know, people just can't reach their tree stand from underneath the tree, you know? Uh, our second one is they often forget because of doing something every day, especially around the holidays. It's the busiest time of the year. So, and our third problem is we often find that even when they do water their tree, it typically isn't enough. Their tree will die quickly. It's just a dry piece of lumber. It's dangerous, it's flammable. So we set out, our team and I set out to solve that problem. Bobby? There have been many previous attempts to solve this problem. However, ours is the most convenient. Tree Nanny has a monitoring device, so when the water level gets low, it will play jingle bells to notify you if it needs to be refilled. The issue is that it is not automatic, so you still have to fill it whenever, and let's say you're busy and it needs to be refilled, it will just play jingle bells over and over again. That is not something that's very convenient. The Christmas tree watering system is a funnel that is disguised as Santa that will go to a reservoir in the tree stand and with a flow controlled water valve will detect the water level of the tree stand. The problem is that the reservoir is not that large so you still have to refill it frequently. The product also uses gravity in order to get the water in, into the tree stand. So it, not a very convenient product. We have discovered a, uh, a solution of, um, following a lot of trial and error. Um, 
that he it may have failed in attempts, but we made self watering Christmas tree stand that with a water sensor inside of the and inside of the stand measures the amount of water level in, uh, in the stand. Um, that's connected through a series of wires through uh, our Dorito circuit board and a generator that would push the water through the tube into the stand whenever the water is touching that sensor. And when, as soon as it does touch the sensor, it stops. And um, it's still for, for the day, and it'll, it'll continue to do that. Um, if you have any questions or would like to see it work, you can use us up on the board. Hello, my name is Kylie Driver, and these are my partners, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Seward and Ashley Thompson. This is our presentation on treating Alzheimer's disease with nanotechnology. Alzheimer's disease is a significant problem because there is no cure for the 6 million people that are affected in the United States today. The main cause of Alzheimer's is the buildup of amyloid plaques. Amyloid plaques are misshaped versions of the protein known as beta amyloid that is found in the brain. The problem with these plaques is as they clump and spread throughout the brain, they cause neuron disruption. This means that when the healthy neuron cells are damaged, they will no longer be able to function or communicate properly within the brain. Unfortunately, this causes the brain to shrink and furthers the progression of the disease. Adikanumab is a monoclonal antibody marketed as Adahome. Through an intravenous infusion, this drug travels around the bloodstreams through the circulatory system and then hits the amyloid plaques within the brain to then deteriorate them. However, this is theorized to disrupt plaques and may increase harmful side effects that can then damage our, co our cognitive function to our patients. For our innovation, we came up with using a form of nanotechnology, nanocapsules, to target the amyloid plaques. Inside of the nanocapsule will be the previously mentioned drug, aducanumab. The nanocapsule will then be surgically or intranasally placed this will cause less side effects because it is only affecting the plaques in the brain and not the healthy plaques throughout the body. Our innovation is intended for early onset Alzheimer patients because it cannot stop any damage that has already occurred, but it can prevent any new damage from forming. It is also very effective because it passes the blood-brain barrier. If you'd like to hear more about our innovation, we invite you back to our poster. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Thomas Goldsbro, and this is my partner, Kern Metz. Uh, a pro and our innovation that we uh, invented was the trash pusher down. A problem that we noticed was far too much trash in outdoor trash cans in local residential neighborhoods. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, residential trash is up by 20% uh, because people are staying at home more and you know, ordering more to-go foods. And some consequences of this excess of trash is that when the trash bags can't fit in the bin properly, you can have trash falling out, which causes pollution. And if the lid isn't secured tightly, uh, you run the risk of animals getting into your trash can. Uh, a survey that we took among uh, households of the community found that 76.5% of households have had trash problems in the past six months, and 21.6% of those surveys said they had issues with trash 10 or more times. Other solutions are on the market but are mainly for industrial use are way too large, are not portable, and are highly ineffective. So our solution that we came up with is the uh, trash pusher downing. And uh, after we had come up with the final sketch, we began prototype construction. And there are some elements missing from the final sketch that we had to forego during prototype construction. 
uh, due to either time constraints or material costs. Uh, this could be a metal plate seen in the, the bottom left picture. And we had a poker pole also to help get the air out of the trash bags that we had to forego. Uh, our prototype works by the clamps on the side, uh, clamping onto the side of the trash can and bracing up against the lid when the lever is pulled. And when you pull the lever repeatedly, the uh, compaction piece in the middle goes down and compacts the trash. And if you have any more questions, uh, you can meet us outside at a poster and we have a day. cells and personalized organ regeneration. My name is Edward Irizarry. And I'm Dylan Manlin. The problem of organ failure has been around for centuries. Diet and lifestyle choices such as alcohol consumption and substance use have all contributed to the problem of cirrhosis, as well as genetic factors such as blood type and genetic makeup. Requiring a surrogate or a donor to receive a new functioning liver. But, unfortunately, a new crisis has been forming. The lack of donors and the extreme waste of organs, which approximately seems to be three out of every 1,000 organs, have all contributed to this terrible crisis, causing many to be put on the life on the waiting list for centuries, even decades, and even a lifetime, often relating to 2,000 deaths yearly. Fortunately, new procedures such as split reduced transplantation and reduced transplantation have all been implemented in order to conserve the amount of liver tissue used, but they're falling short. They only conserve, they don't give back. And the patient has to be put on dialysis for long periods of time, which can inflict both mental and physical harm. Our innovation would use an organ that was deemed non-viable for transplantation due to various reasons, and first beginning to decellularize it or basically making it devoid of any genetic material by pumping water mixed with ammonium, ammonium hydroxide into the vena cava and out through the portal vein in order to get rid of any form of genetic material. In order to appropriately re-cellularize this newly created scaffold, stem cells have to be extracted from the bone marrow. These stem cells will then be differentiated into hepatocytes, which can then be seeded into the scaffold at which point they will be left for two months until the liver has regenerated into 20% capacity where it will be viable for transplantation. Moreover, our, our solution is more beneficial than any other current solution due to the fact that it has the ability to reuse wasted organs as well as add to the organ pool in general. Moreover, it is, more, it is more ethical than traditional stem cells as it does not use fetal stem cells, but rather adult stem cells. Finally, it offers a high biocompatibility, biocompatibility being a serious issue in the organ regenerative organ field, as without high compatibility, an organ will be rejected. Thank you. If you have any more uh, questions about our project, please visit us in the cafeteria. Hello, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Jake Gordon Aaron. These are my partners, Alex Reed and Tyler Brushwood, and our product is Divide and Secure. All right, so on the right, there is an image. On the top, sorry. Uh, it is a, it is a uh, truck with a whole bunch of like stuff in the back, and you can see that the coolers are not really secured in there. So that's our target to you know, just go after that and secure them in. So I'm a big stats guy, so I found that according to the NHTSA, across the U.S. in 2016, unsecured pickup truckloads caused 683 deaths, 19,663 injuries, and over 90,000 traffic incidents. And to the bottom right, you can see an image of like a whole bunch of different directions. So truckloads can move up in three directions. They can go upward, go left and right, and they can go forward and backwards, and that's what we want to prevent. Uh, there are, the pathways that people have used to solve this solution are, uh, can be split down into four different categories. These include ratchet straps, bed nets, rolled up bed covers, and toolboxes. But all of these solutions fail to prevent 
one of the, the ways that items can move in the back of a pickup truck. Ratchet straps not only take too long to tie down and install, but they don't stop side to side motion. The bed net does not stop side to side or front to back motion. The rolled up bed cover does prevent up and down motion, but not side to side or front to back. And the toolbox has a restriction on the size of the items. So, our solution. The thing that we came up with was an adjustable divider system that would aim to tackle all three forms of movement as my partners have just listed. Uh, our product can be broken down into five main parts. The first being the main body, then we have connectors, dividers, hooks, and a netting system. The main body, seen in the top and bottom middle, is acts as a barrier that stops any item from moving forward and backward in the truck bed. The connectors, as seen on the bottom left, secure that main body so that the whole product do itself doesn't move. Um, the dividers, uh, as seen in the bottom right, those act to stop side-to-side -side motion and can be adjusted to any width depending on what item you have to secure. The hooks that are on the divider, as seen in the bottom right again, those can be used to secure any items such as grocery bags or smaller items, stuff like that. that those, uh, these hooks will prevent these items from going in any direction. Lastly, the netting system. The netting system is rolled up in the top of the design and can be stretched out to the back of the truck bed to prevent any items from flying upward. When you put all of these components together, we successfully managed to stop all three forms of motion and keep drivers safe all, all on the road. Uh, if you guys would like to hear more about our product, please join us outside in the cafeteria at our booth. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Grace Hines. This is my partner, Alex Branson. And over the last few months, we've been investigating the concussion epidemic. In the United States, approximately 3.8 million concussions are reported annually with over 300,000 of these being related to sports and other recreational activities. However, upon further investigation, it has been determined that this statistic is likely underestimated since roughly 50% of all concussions go unreported and are simply swept under the rug. A concussion occurs when an individual has experienced a blow or a jolt to the head. This leads to rapid head motions and causes the brain to move back and forth within the skull. Additionally, this particular injury comes with a wide range of short and long-term consequences, many of which are neurological. To add, neurons are damaged due to sheer forces created within the brain, and bruising may be observed at sites of impact. While many technologies and methods currently exist today to detect and diagnose concussions, many of these fall short in providing a quick diagnosis and leads to patients receiving delayed treatment or none at all. Athletes especially are at an increased risk of developing concussions due to enduring collisions during gameplay, which may be with another player or game equipment. As concussions become more and more prevalent within the sports industry, it is crucial that technology exists that acts as an immediate indicator of concussion to allow athletes to receive treatment as soon as possible and reduce their risk of developing the short and long term consequences typically associated with concussions. So why is this concerning? When an athlete experiences a concussion, there are a plethora of symptoms ranging in severity from minor headaches to major personality changes that may take place. This series of symptoms is formally recognized as a syndrome known as post-concussion syndrome. Of course, while these syndromes and side effects are only a few, the list goes on and on ranging from depression to the further degeneration of motor and cognitive skills and even death. For those athletes that suffer from repeated concussions, they are more at risk and are likely to develop such disorders such as second impact syndrome and in extreme cases, CTE. With these problems and concerns in mind, Grace and I developed a two-part diagnostic system composed of a newly innovated impact sensing mouth guard and a previously existing iSync headset that communicate on a Bluetooth connection to a mobile app database. The purpose of this two-step diagnostic system is to provide concussion detection both in games with the impact sensing mouth guards and on the sidelines via the headset while achieving universal design for all sports. If you would like to learn more about Grace and I's innovation, please feel free to visit our poster in the cafeteria. I'm Katie Valentino, and this is Danielle Kozowski, and we are the biomedical sciences interns for this school year. Before we move on to the closing remarks, we'd like to take a moment to thank our teacher, other one, if she could come join us. Um, 
This is her last year working with Ken Island High School. Her dedication and passion for the subject has not only motivated us throughout that pathway, but in pursuit of science beyond. The pathway would not be the same without you. You really, truly help everyone excel and be the best students that we can be. It was a pleasure to get to work so closely with you, and on behalf of all the BioMed students past and present, we would like to thank you so much for all that you do and hope you have a great retirement. Um, clearly I failed to teach them that I don't like surprises. <laughs> um, I would like to say, wow, what some amazing projects that you saw tonight and what bright futures the students have. Let's give them all a round of applause. So now you know who I am. My name is Mrs. Sutherland and I do teach with Ms. Ritz in the Biomed Pathway. And tonight it is my honor to publicly announce that Ken Island High School, along with 190 high schools nationwide, was recently recognized by Project Lead the Way as a distinguished high school. Of the 140 high schools in the state of Maryland, Project Lead the Way recognized 10 high schools for excelling despite all the setbacks we had in our learning process since the spring of 2020. Ken Island High School, however, is the only high school in the state of Maryland that has held this honor for five consecutive years. This, of course, is due to the hard work and dedication of our students, many of whom you have heard from tonight but it is also because of the support of our greater community. So we would like to take this opportunity to thank our families and friends that have joined us here tonight in support of our students, our administration and Board of Education for their daily support as we do some crazy things pushing these kids um, in these projects, our Ken Island High School faculty and staff that also support us in our endeavors, also, we would like to publicly thank our project mentors who helped our students and our alumni who have come back to support our program continuously. Your continuous support helps keep this program strong. Now we invite you all to please join us in the cafeteria to learn more in depth about each one of these student projects and they are anxious to share their innovations with you. Thank you. Thank you. 
um, and killing off any pathogens that are in there it certainly would make us all healthy. Hi, hi, I'm Rebecca Ranson and I am one of the five men science teachers here at Penn Island. Um, we were really excited to be able to be back in person presenting our innovation projects for the whole Project Lead the Way uh, pathways for engineering and biomed. Um, one of the things that really impressed me most with our students was their um, their desire to want to continue the pathway and work really hard given the challenges of the past two years. They, they pushed through, they you know, had to learn virtually for part of their, their pathway completion and their persistence was just unwavering throughout the whole pandemic and continues um, throughout this whole process of creating their, their projects. Um, they, they really are cool projects and I know everybody tonight really enjoyed hearing about their innovation. They're excited about their, their projects. It's pretty catchy. You know, you can see that. All right, Josh. So, hi, I'm Josh Song. I'm the engineering teacher here at Kent Island High School uh, for Project Lead the Way. And uh, yeah, just to, you know, this was a great year. Great to be back. First time since 2019 that we've had students actually get to present and finish out their projects uh, without, you know, virtual or, or hybrid learning. Um, and it was really great to just get back to normal and, uh, and seeing projects that you know, are in line with what we expect every year. So we had some great projects this year, some kids with some really good ideas, and, uh, and, and working prototypes is great. These are cruel questions, but what blew you away? Josh Uh You know, actually the clean cap bottle design, <laughs> uh, I was kind of jealous that that wasn't a project in the engineering class. Right. I'm not going to lie. That's uh, that, one, that one really blew me away. Well, and Barbara said the same thing. <laughs> that was her. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there were some innovations that I think, I really, I was blown away by all of them on both sides of the um, Project Lead the Way pathways. It's just so cool to see how the students' brains work and the diverse projects that we're here tonight, not just, you know, one one type topic or another, but all the diversity between all the kids and, and showing their passion through their projects because, you know, again, with the Project. It's not the one blew me away over the other because it's about what was passionate for that kid okay. and what they wanted to study and research. Well, you can sort of see topics that are in the news like Alzheimer's, right? Which, how I many Alzheimer's uh, projects were there? And also the magic nanoparticles, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Yeah, and nanoparticles are, you know, it's a, it's a new type of technology used in the biomedical field, and there's a lot still unknown, but there's still a lot of potential. Um, you know, there's a lot behind the nanoparticle that the students began to understand, but not completely. Yes. But at least you know, getting that interest maybe will spark something they want to pursue in the future, um, which is really cool. And I, they did the best they could do with given our resources and the time constraints that they had. Uh, but our mentors were also very beneficial in helping them, um, you know, work through some of the hurdles um, that they had with their projects. And Josh, there's still, still plenty of room for innovation in, in uh, engineering and uh, math. Yeah, I think, you know, this year we saw a lot more focus on electronics, um, bringing in, you know, Arduino, the maker movement, the Internet of Things. Yeah. Um, and, and that's always kind of there and, and something for them to embrace because it's tangible. You know, the, the biggest restraint or constraint that, that our kids work under in engineering uh, is they have less than three months. To do something that you know, you see somebody go out on Shark Tank. They've invested three, four, five years oh, yeah. in that prototype, um, and our kids are trying to come up with something in three months that works. And uh, you know, it was really great again just to have a year where I think every group had something functioning, something tangible uh, that worked in at least one way. And do, during the project, you guys nudge them in the right whatever that means direction, or you just kind of let them go. Uh, with, I mean, and I, with the sponsors too. Yeah, I, I think, you know, here there's, as you get down to the wire, sometimes you give them a little helpful nudge so that so that they can be successful in, right. in something. But no, for the most part, uh, you, you, let them, you let them go out there and, and they have to learn to fail uh, to be successful. So, part of you know, sometimes failure is not in the grade book, sometimes it's uh, in the real world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you learn from that. There's a lesson to be learned from that too. Very good, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what made you come up with this idea? So Alex and I are just very involved in sports, and we have, I mean, I personally have not had a concussion, but a lot of our friends have, and so just the thought of coming up with a way to protect concussions, like, as soon as it happens, um, I personally didn't deal with concussions. It's a terrible thing that's happened, just happens naturally in sports, and so... You know, it sucks that they have to be out of the game for so long, so we just wanted to come up with an innovation that will tackle it. 
And there's so much uh, coverage of this problem now, right, with football. Yeah. And any sport. Especially in the NFL. Yeah. They've covered the issue. Yeah. The whole protocol, we're going to call the game, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, like, in the NFL like, specifically, there was a like, lack of education uh, and awareness. So that's why part of this was tackling is the whole fact of learning what a profession is and um, how to get properly diagnosed in a, in a timely manner. We hear about players dying. Yeah. You know? It seems outrageous. Thank you. All right, guys, how did you come up with this? Uh, we came up with this idea because uh, I personally drive a truck. I drive a truck every day. Um, I love driving trucks. And, yeah. I've, also, and I've noticed that when I'm driving, all my items are flying around. I've never dropped back. So you're the guy dropping stuff out of the truck? Yes. I've noticed when I'm driving, I hit the brakes. I'll hear whatever it's cool or whatever it may be. I'm up against the bed of my truck. I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah. So we designed this so that that would stop. And during our research, we found that this, uh, this problem actually kills 683 Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we went and came up with Will this be? Well, there it is. So you actually have the the model. Okay. Very good. Was it hard to build? It was mainly because we just made a few key mistakes. It sent us back a few days. So yeah. There. Okay. But in the end, it all came together, and it's a working prototype. How much does it weigh? Um, each each part. So it's multiple parts. Yeah. Each part was just under twenty pounds. Okay. So if you put them together, maybe around forty, something like that. But. A real one would have be plastic or whatever. Yeah, this is just because it costs materials in our, our budget. Of there you go. So, so Good job. What was about your project? Uh, our project was based off of the uh, use of stem cells and organ regeneration. We started with the liver because it already has a higher injective capacity. So we can transition from the liver into other organs as the field advances. The reason we chose to try and regenerate organs because of the high amount of waste in the organ. Yeah. It's uh, some 90, 97 out of a thousand organs are not used. That's insane. Yeah. And so our idea was that we want to take those organs that no one's using and reuse them using the own organs and stem cells. And instead of using fetal stem cells, which are highly debated, we decided to go with uh, okay. bone marrow stem cells or adult stem cells. And we could also do cellularize it so that it's just, it's like not even a liquid. It's a, it's a frame, basically. It's a frame, yeah. It's a frame of liver. Sometimes it can go into the shape of a human liver. What sh- in your research, what shocked you the most? The amount of waste? Yes. The amount. Uh, yeah, yeah. The crisis, because... Because people, like you said, are waiting lifetimes. Yeah. They're waiting lifetimes, and the biggest problem with that is, is it comes from the, uh, the way that we find matches. Like, you can get an organ, like, here in Maryland, but if the only match is in California, it'll never last that long. Right. Big problem with like the storage, but that's a whole separate issue. Yeah. Oh, go, go, go. So you can't really solve factors of alcoholism. So instead of actually restricting it, you would much rather just find a solution to it. A very easy and replaceable solution. Such as There you go. I have to say, you have the best name of everything. It rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, right. So this is a gadget. This is it. Take this or lift this up, put it on the trash can, and actually in that picture. Yep. Slide this thing on and start cranking. And if you have three fresh cans, you just move it to can to can to can. And it fits on uh, these things, they slide against it. Gotcha, you okay. On smaller trash cans, larger trash cans. Right. I think you guys have a hit. Alright guys, tell us, tell us about your project. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to be up with using the nanotechnology to target the amyloid plaques for Alzheimer's disease. Which is the basic cause of uh, Alzheimer's. Yes. So, we use a nanopouch with the drug as a handicap, and that drug has been previously FDA approved for Alzheimer's, but we decided to put it in the nanocapsule so that it only targets the plaques in the brain and not the plaques throughout the whole body. Which there are other places as well, right? Yes. Tell us more. So, plaques like endone cholesterol, they won't be affected as much because this will be inserted either intravasally through the nose to pass the blood brain barrier. I'm wincing at all this, but go ahead. That encapsulates the brain, or it will be surgically implanted. 
to Okay. You put the you put the uh, catheter where the problem is, yes. only where the problem is. Very good. And then it goes straight to the plaques and doesn't harm anything else. How quickly does the uh, uh, Duda Camp Lab work? So, uh, Thank you. It it could take like a few weeks to work on this because well, once it once this scanner capsule reaches your amyloid block. Yeah. What could you say? <laughs> we're using the aducanumab drug because it's the only like um, yeah. the FDA. So like it's been through a clinical trial and it's successful. We're using this because we think like before it was an uh, intranet intranasal yep. and intravenously, but the yep. version is going to like target more directly. And uh, we are doing this because we just but the only thing with it is not gonna prevent like it's going to prevent damage, but from damage that's already occurred. Right. We can't, we're not rebuilding the neurons, we're preventing more from being damaged. But you're putting the one drug that works at the right place. Yes. yes. So then it doesn't part, like, disrupt like all the other natural plaques in our body, just the plaques in the brain. Okay. So that will make the patients a lot more sick when you harm like, your healthy really? plaques. Really? Yes. So that, that causes all the things that happen. Okay. Uh, and, our, and our target audience is the early onset patients. Early. Thank you guys. Title? What is that? I might ask. Self-watering Christmas tree. Okay. Now what we've got here is a water sensor. Now you see these coils whenever the some point. Whenever the uh, water hits the coils, it'll yep. send an electrical signal to stop the motor within this this bucket here. Okay. Now that's cooked up hooked up to our breadboard, right? So yep. that's cooked up to the battery. So whenever that stops, the water will stop filling and it will go until it reaches a certain point to keep the tree watered at all times and to prevent spills and overflow. So, oh, it won't overflow. It will you won't, you won't soak the carpet. We'll maintain that level because it'll turn itself off whenever it gets that level. And then when it, you know, start, the tree starts to lose some of that water, you know, that the water will kind of kick back on to get it back up to So depending on the house, how often would it run, probably? Well, it really uh, depends on what tree you get. The tree, okay. the yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. But, uh, most average people will get about an eight-foot tree weighing about 100 pounds or so. Yeah. And this will keep it watered actually for a whole week with the uh, five-gallon bucket. Oh! In the flow rate, it might not seem that quick, but in our test, we found that it can do up to 3.2 gallons an hour, which is far quicker than it can suck up all Far more than any tree. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it is more than enough, and it can hold up to five gallons. So, yeah. yeah. It's a good one. It's not a Not in a, no. Not a fireplace or whatever. Say something. Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, So the water storage to give you two also, um, you know, we come in a like, box, like a sort of like a bottle. Okay. It would just be kind of important to be out of the way. And also just kind of unrecognized. You could wrap it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like a tree, like a gift. Yeah, it would, it would come out and wrap the calories. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a prototype, so it doesn't look aesthetically the best. But yeah. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. an actual product, it would look a lot cleaner. Sure. Thank you guys. That was great. All right. So, your idea is embrace making the uh, uh, knee braces more effective. How does that work? So, you. So, embrace is a ABS classic mode that allows. Any user to have their knee brace fit them perfectly, it goes at the top and bottom of the knee brace. Um, ABS Plastic is a remodeling plastic that's been used for many different types of remodeling things, such as Legos. How, why, did you, why did you two guys come up with this idea? Because knee braces currently they slip around and you're obviously not, it's not doing nothing if it's sliding all the way down to the seat. Yeah. yeah. It's not protecting anything. And, was it hard to come up with the design, either one of you? No, I would say not. No, it was obvious when you looked at old uh, other braces, right? You say why? So you saw why they don't work. So it's a theoretical idea, so it hasn't actually been tested yet. Right, right. But eventually, it can be. Tested. No. Thank you.
Good job. Right, so. What do we have here? All right, so here we have this motion sensor activated light switch. So, in your so case, right here, as you can see, this is what it looks like when it's the finished product. Okay. So you just wave your hand in front of it. Okay. Like that. And then for a cross section, this is how it looks like on the inside. So then that's how it works. You see oh, okay. Oh, oh, it's simple enough. Okay. Yep. And then here we just have all of like the inside components just separated. So like you can easily see. Oh, okay. This one's having some problems. It's our oldest one. So okay. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But you guys designed the circuit. Okay. You designed the circuit to make it work, right? Yeah. And this will be at the room walk. Right switch, yeah. right? Yes. So basically, you just have the regular uh, okay. switch cover, and then it uses the same screws. Oh, clever. Yeah. So you can just, you know, put it on there, and then underneath it just has a switch, and it just flips yeah. it, so yeah. you don't have to touch it, you know, to limit germ spreading. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was horrifying about all the germs everywhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. yeah, they're very, very, very dirty. All right, how did you guys come up with this great idea? Uh, oh, I thought of it. There's a, there's a machine for basketball. You shoot it in, it shoots it back to you. And I thought something that for baseball would be really helpful. So he also plays baseball. So oh, okay. That helps. And I, I always have trouble. Like, I don't know how to practice doing balls on my own. So I thought something like this would be really helpful. Uh, but all the other techniques aren't all that good. Uh, there's been prototypes in the past that have been alright, but they're way too big and expensive. And I mean, the patents are so expired too because people didn't pay the fees. And this, it's um, good, but you can only practice for short distances and it's not always accurate. Yeah. Our project can shoot it right back to where you are. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Our project has a much higher velocity because it uses a pitching machine. Yep. And like, if you just throw it out of there, it would obviously lose a lot of speed. Sure. It would be like a game time scenario. Now this, you, had, you said you had to be accurate, correct? What'd you say? You had to be pretty accurate to get it in the right yeah, spot. This one, yeah, we just wanted to make sure the concept for it works because it's simple enough, like I said up there, that you can adjust it. Yeah. But yeah, you have to throw it pretty accurately here for it yeah. to work. Although, practicing your aim isn't a bad idea either. Uh, that, that would actually be great. You don't have to chase the ball once you get it. Like, you have to throw it well. Say something. Say something. Yeah. Uh, it, would, would this be easy to, easy to build? Is it easy to build? Yeah. Uh, then we, originally, we weren't going to do it with the... We have a mattress back there, which is yeah. how it stopped. Like, originally, we were going to have a net. Yeah. And we were going to try and like catch it and then roll back into the gutter. Right. Some sort, but we just found that, I mean... It was there was too much I guess it kept bouncing off the net rather than catching it in the corner. Yeah. yeah. So, so practicality. This kills the momentum. Yeah. yeah. Where the net it would still have too much tension when it's all the way back, but the momentum would transfer back in the ball and bounce. Okay. Uh, Great idea guys. Where are we here? Uh, this is my project called Focus Up. Yep. Uh, it's intended to like says help you focus, uh, stop you from zoning out. Most, for me, uh, I got the idea when I was uh, losing focus in class a lot, and uh, I really just decided I wanted to do something based around that. Uh, and I, the hardest part of it was uh, the code. That's been, that took me a solid two weeks or so, because uh, I don't use code that often. So. So it made you work with it. So the, so the, so the equipment kind of comes pre-prepared? You had to write the code to run the equipment? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Very good. This seems like a great idea for a car, you know? Yeah, or part of it, yeah. Uh, meditation? Yeah. Uh, I found this information in an article about truck drivers who found that they, when they zone out on roads, they yeah. end up yeah. crashing often. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Very nice. Tell me about. Uh, hold on, let me get a let me picture of the of the uh, your title, and then tell me about your project. You start. Uh, what is it? What are you doing? What do you what do you so what problem are you solving? We're shooting Alzheimer's using neural stem cell nanoparticles, and we're using theranostic nanoparticles. I'm sorry. What does that mean? <laughs> the ranonostic. I don't even know what it means. Theranostic nanoparticles is a type of nanoparticle that has specifically been used to treat brain tumors in the brain. Okay. So it's already been used. So it's been proven before. 
Uh, I think it's that was still in the trial. Okay, okay. But your idea is to treat. Okay, so it's to treat Alzheimer's disease uh, and prevent further damage of the neurons within the brain. So it will be injected uh, through a lumbar puncture into the spinal fluid, which will allow for the nanoparticle to travel through the blood-brain barrier into the brain. And uh, with Faith mentioning earlier that uh, the theranosic nanoparticle has already traveled through the blood-brain barrier yeah, okay. to treat brain tumors, that's yeah. why we decided to use this nanoparticle out of all the ones that are already available. Yeah. And uh, it will travel through, attack the abnormal amounts of amyloid uh, plaque deposits and tau tangles, which is the main reasoning that Alzheimer's disease destroys the neurons within the brain. It seems like a really great idea. You, again, you're putting the, the, the uh, technique where the problem is, right? Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right, tell me about your project, guys. Um, our project is with a particle gel for the treatment of atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is pretty much just retaining exactly the same. The buildup of cholesterol and other solid particles in the blood vessels causing blockages, and as, which can lead to heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, and great fun things to have in the body. So in order to address this, we designed a particle, like a nanoparticle gel, that would be applied oh, by an angioplasmic stent uh, to the plaque in order to degrade it over time. The plaque will be applied, or sorry, the, the nanoparticle gel will be applied to a stent or an angioplasty, okay. which, which is only holding the thing open. Yes, which will hold it open as seen in these two images Right, here. yep. Um, and it will take effect on the plaque to like break it down and make it water soluble so that it will flow to the kidneys where it will be removed through urine and this prevents it from causing more heart problems. And, so and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're putting the, the, the magic stuff at the right spot. Yes. So if you uh, introduce like say, the cytodextrin, which is the drug. Yeah, okay. Makes the uh, cholesterol water soluble. Right. Uh, if, if you introduced it into the blood, like intravenously, yeah, yeah. it would cause, it could potentially cause just problems as it would, it would collect like good cholesterol and cholesterol okay. that right. needed for the building of cells. Yep. And which might obviously would cause problems because then you can't create, create any cells yes. and you're not really getting to the problem at hand. Yeah. So if you apply it to the gel, which is just meant there to hold it there, yeah. and apply it to the source, uh, it'll degrade, it'll be used right then and there. Okay. Layer by layer. How quickly? How quickly does it water, water, <laughs> Um, Reduce the effect. So it's a, the, the, uh, uh, wouldn't that be something that would be found in like the testing stages? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like we, we don't really gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't exist. No, yeah. you're coming up with a technique to get it there. Yeah. yeah. You're not developing the, the, the yeah. stuff. Yeah. We also don't have the funds to do something oh. like that. Oh. Yeah. Really? Huh. Yeah. So the particle doesn't exist. And, yeah. But that release of the drug could be adjusted over time. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. As you make it. Gotcha. And as well as the the gel, I believe uh, lasts around a few weeks and will be broke by the new Okay, okay. Because it's made of albumin, which is a natural human protein. So it can be broken down like any other extra cell. So you might need to reapply it, but it's not that that horrible way to, to do it. Yeah, it's, it's a way better alternative to say uh, open heart surgery. Oh, yeah. And it's a way faster recovery time. Yeah, okay. And, and overall, like, in one chunk, it may be more expensive because it has more, more materials being used. But since it won't be as, as frequent as other techniques, then it will long-term be cheaper. Yeah, and then uh, so it also would, <laughs> and then you have since it's being pressed, uh, it would increase the surface area of the of the, um, of the gel that is exposed to it to the plaque. Yep. So it would take less time than say you just coated the uh, like, say, here. Yeah. If you just coated that, it would take more time because you have that whole sure. 
but since it's flat, you have. But you're targeting and, and yeah. pressing it on there. It's yeah. very targeted. Great, very good, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.